hard knowing that traffic is terrible. We were trying to figure out the right time to do this. And a lot of people thought, I know not, somebody just said not now, one of the, <laughs> uh, but we thought if we did 530, it was a group consensus. If we did 530, people could come from work. And if you did seven, people didn't want to go home and come back. And we'll take comments on that at the end. <laughs> But I just, um, in a minute, I want to introduce all of um, our elected officials. I may have each of the elected officials in a minute introduce themselves so you can hear from them. Je Justin Hodge, who's the chair of the uh, Washington County Commissioners, is going to speak after me. Others are declining because we really want to hear from the experts up here. But I want to tell you why we're here. Um, Everybody, well, first of all, we're here because of 40 year issue, almost 40 year issue. And um, I want to kind of take you to what we've been through and where we are. And really, I think a lot of progress has been made in the last couple of years. I know a lot of people have had concerns. We want to answer those concerns today and have the experts themselves answer those questions. But I think that we have made more progress than I have seen since I've been a member of Congress, which isn't forever, uh, but I mean, I will. So let me, this started 40 years ago. And I'm gonna tell you that when I became a member, which was eight years ago, I really dug into this. And this is a personal opinion, and I'm sure somebody will yell at me for saying this, but I believe that the fluter may have deliberately, remember there are four townships and a lot of surrounding areas that are involved in this. And I believe that you were pitted against each other and that there was, it was very difficult to reach common ground. Caroline, come on up front. Uh, Caroline, come on up. Um, I want all the elected officials up front because after we hear from the experts, when we ask questions, you're gonna be able to ask anybody, as long as it's on this subject, anything you want on this subject. Um, but it, there have been a consent decree in the earlier in 2012, 2013, 20, 2011. 2011. That is the consent decree that's currently in place. But a lot of people were still concerned. I mean, there was another consent decree that was negotiated between four communities. I was not a partner to it. There was a, um, the judge had put a uh, people, none of the jurisdictions were able to talk about it. People didn't feel that there was transparency, which there wasn't, to be perfectly frank. Um, not casting that at anybody here. Um, I've gotten to know the EPA and the Eagle people in this field super well. And several years ago, we brought all four communities together several times in official meetings where they actually met the Open Meeting Act, quorums where roll calls were called, there were meetings, votes were taken officially. And I, I wanna thank Tim, I'm gonna introduce people in a minute, but EPA and Eagle and the AG's office were also at every one of those meetings talking them through. Uh, and then uh, there was a consent decree that was rejected by the court several years ago. Gelman may have been one of the people trying to cause a lot of problems. But in the meantime, after multiple joint meetings, open, transparent <coughs> to the public, all four communities in the Washtenaw County, Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor uh, Township and Sile Township <coughs> voted to ask the governor to, in order, to remember that if you're gonna be listed on the national priority list, you, the governor has to consent. And there had been, even in the midst of all this, I'm not pointing fingers, but maybe the state didn't remember, we had a lot of administrations, a lot of discussions. The previous administrations may not have thought that was the right way to go. Every time EPA was here, they would love, Tim, would say to us, you know, this is a process. I'm gonna tell you if you've done this 20 years ago, you might have like been 15 years into the process, but we, we knew all the issues. So, and I'm, they're gonna talk to you about the facts, what's happened, because you need to hear from the experts, not me, but I wanna take you to why we are meeting tonight. After 
after the consent decree was rejected, the consent decree that was in place was a 2000, or yeah, 2011, 2011 consent decree, which has a number that's too low to protect you. And Dana's job, especially at the Attorney General, sorry, I didn't mean to be, her job is to protect you and to make sure that you are being protected. And I, a lot of people had questions. She's going to take that, she's going to discuss it head on and answer those questions. EPA is going to tell you, a lot of you, and they're going to say it to you, so I don't want to steal their thunder, but everybody was worried that that would mean that we, the site couldn't be listed on the national priorities. EPA absolutely assured everybody, and we'll talk to you tonight, that that was not the case. People have been worried about the testing, and yes, it has spread to some wells, and people are worried about that. I want to say to you that I am the biggest nag in the world. I am out there. EPA and EGLE are talking to each other all the time. They are making sure you are not drinking water that is going to harm you. And EPA's got an emergency response team that they've assured me a million times. It really does seem like a million. Um, that if something happens and there, but I want you to hear it directly from them because people have questions. And the EPA is also going to talk about different jurisdictions have said, if this does get listed, I'm going to let them talk about where we are. I'm not going to tell you where I know they are. Who's going to control the site? Is it Eagle or EPA? It is EPA. Tim is going to address that. But I'm here tonight because I listen to all of you. And I know that you're worried and concerned. And you have people on this panel that hear your concern. You've got elected officials that are fighting for you every day. They've learned, I mean, they have learned more about toxin than they've ever wanted to. They know they've got to work together. And we're all working together. And that's what we want to talk to you about tonight. Mo, well, I do want you to know all the elected officials, and I think I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves so you see them and know rather than my do it, because I want you to see their face and hear their voice. And then uh, Justin Hodges, who's the chair of the Wayne Washington County Commission, is going to talk to you, but then we're going to move into our experts in our panel who are going to answer your questions. I want to thank Greg Deal and Crystal for helping to organize the site to bring people together. It is also being, t uh, it's on a number of sources, it's being streamed so people can see it and we will make sure that what happens here is available to people after this night. So why don't, why don't I start with Mayor Taylor and just have you introduce yourself. He's taller than the rest of us. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christopher Taylor, I'm the Mayor of Ann Arbor. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Scott, and County Commissioner for District 9, which is probably many of you since it's really impacting us. Thanks. Shannon Beeman, Washtenaw County Commissioner, District 3, southwestern corner of Washtenaw. Jason Bocieski, County Commissioner, District Number 1, which is the northwestern part of Washtenaw County. Justin Hodge, County Commissioner for District 5, that's the southeast corner of the county. I'm Chris Watson, City Council Member for Ward 2 in Ann Arbor. Crystal Light, Board of Commission, District 2. Caroline Sanders, uh, District 4, Pittsville Township, primarily some Ipsy Township. Hi, Diane O'Connell, Supervisor, Ann Arbor Township. Kathy's here, right? Kathy, Kathy's in the back, Kathy Knoll. Um, from Sio, and I have not seen Will, but I know he was going to try to get here. So John Reiser, John's here. So that you know, you guys can come up here. So you like being in the back? That's where I sit in church. <laughs> um, Justin, I'm going to introduce to you, and then we'll get to the panel. All right, I'll be very brief because I want us to uh, get to the experts. I'm Justin Hodge. I represent District 5, as I just said a moment ago. Um, that's most of Ypsilanti Township and all of Augusta Township and also chair of the Board of Commissioners. Uh, I just want to echo the last points that Congresswoman Dingle mentioned about how critically uh, we all take this issue. You have 
local, county, state, and federal government represented here, uh, and we're all working together very hard to address this. This is an issue that we're all going to have to work together on, uh, and I want the community to understand that all of us in government take this extremely seriously, and that's why you have all of us here. Uh, really grateful to have this panel uh, that is going to be able to share a lot of really important information with us, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll hear some really good news too. So with that, I'll turn it back to Congressman Dingle so we can get to the panel. Thank you. So we did, made a deliberate, we're going to go from EPA to EGLE to the Attorney General. Um, because each of them's got, the Attorney General can address issues after you've heard from EPA and EGLE, and so we're going in that order. I first want to introduce Tim Fisher, who is the EPA Superfund Branch Chief. He's new to, I mean, he's not new to EPA, but many of you who've been at other meetings know Joan, who uh, probably knows this site better than anybody wants to know the site. <laughs> uh, but Tim is, is new and it, new to the job of being a, a branch chief, but he is not new to this project and is very deeply in, in, uh, engrossed. In and, and Tim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Can everyone hear me okay? I don't think it's, it's not picking up. How's is that? it on? Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Fisher. I am a manager in the remedial response program in EPA Region 5 in Chicago. And so here, to, it's nice to see everyone here to talk a little bit about uh, the Gelman site and the status uh, of where we are in the pre-remedial process. Uh, I understand that you guys discussed this quite a bit at the last meeting a few years ago. And I'm happy to report that we have made some significant progress on the pre-remedial uh, process so far. So. Uh, we have continued to make progress. We did receive a, a petition to conduct a preliminary assessment back in 2016. Uh, preliminary assessment generally consists of reviewing historical information uh, and assessing the data that we already have in-house to determine whether or not a site is eligible to continue to the next step. Uh, we did complete that process and we did move to the site inspection phase of the pre-remedial program. Uh, we did conduct some sampling uh, to develop our data set for the site inspection, and we are expecting to issue a report for the site inspection in July of this year, so next month. Uh, we will be posting that report on a website that we have available for the Gilman site, so you'll be able to see uh, the information that we've collected. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, that you know we, we were able to collect enough information that uh, the preliminary information suggests that this site is what we would consider to be NPL caliber. And, and the preliminary score would indicate that it, it, it would be NPL caliber. Uh, I want to caveat that with, the, with some additional information. Ultimately, the decision of whether or not a site goes on the NPL is subject to approval by EPA headquarters and the administrator. Uh, as the Congresswoman alluded to, we would also uh, need uh, agreement from the state of Michigan throughout the process to list the site on the NPL. Uh, and we will have to go through a federal rulemaking process when we propose the site to the NPL. We have to make that proposal available for public comment, uh, and we will add those comments to the document record when that time comes. Uh, so we will be taking the uh, data that we've generated so far. We're actually gonna be conducting an additional sampling effort this summer in residential and commercial groundwater wells to bolster our data set and that the fact that we're conducting that sampling is reflects the fact that we think that this site uh, has a good chance of being listed on the MPL or we wouldn't be conducting that additional work. <coughs> so uh, we will be using the data we collect from that sampling effort to uh, also uh, add to our doc, doc record to support possible listing of the site on the MPL. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there are a lot of steps that we will still need to get through, but we want to be uh, putting ourselves in the position for possible proposal to the NPL in fall of 2024. That's the goal that we have in Region 5. Uh, if the site is listed on the NPL, EPA would become the lead enforcement agency for the site. We would continue to work uh, very closely with our state partners at Eagle as a support agency. Uh, so 
you can certainly expect us to continue working with them, but EPA would become the uh, lead enforcement agency, and one of the first steps that we would conduct as the lead agency is pursuing enforcement uh, against PRPs and hopefully negotiating an agreement with them to conduct a remedial investigation. And uh, just wanted to reiterate what Congressman said about uh, as we collect additional data, if we identify any uh, immediate risk, we will be in constant contact with the state and with our emergency response program and be ready to intervene to protect uh, folks if that is necessary. So that's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Mike Neller, who's Director of Remediation and Redevelopment Division at Eagle. And he too has been with all of you in times past. Hi, thanks, Congresswoman. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad to be here again. Hopefully, we, got, we can answer some of your questions and concerns. So, as you've already heard, uh, this site is governed by a consent judgment, which is now under its uh, Fourth Amendment. And uh, the Fourth Amendment was uh, recently gone into in May of this year, and that was negotiated between the uh, liable party, uh, Gelman and uh, Eagle. Uh, that was done because uh, the response activity order that had been put in place uh, was uh, thrown out by the Court of Appeals. And so we felt that it was important as Congresswoman Dingle already stated, specifically to get the uh, consent judgment amended so that we can get the groundwater criteria in line with what our state criteria is. So it was at 85 parts per billion, and our criteria is 7.2 parts per billion. So 10 times uh, different. So this is uh, much more protective. As a result of that, there's a there's a prohibition zone in the consent judgment that surrounds the area where the where the uh, dioxin plume is, where it, uh, that's a groundwater prohibition zone. So you cannot have a groundwater well uh, drinking taking water from that contaminated uh, aquifer and then drinking it. So um, that uh, subsequently has been redrawn, not because the plume has gotten bigger, but because we now have a much more stringent criteria. So you should also understand that, that along with that prohibition zone, there are certain triggers. So there are monitoring wells around the perimeter of, that, uh, of the prohibition zone. So if there are uh, detections of a certain level, then that triggers certain events that, uh, that can go into place. And those include things like um, uh, additional monitoring, uh, response activities to reduce the levels, the distribution of bottled water, and even can include the connection to a municipal water supply. So all that's in place in the consent judgment so that if it's monitoring, if it looks like this could be moving outside the prohibition zone, then all these additional actions would be, in, uh, would be triggered to protect public health. Um, you should also understand that Eagle, along with the Washtenaw County Health Department, has a residential well uh, monitoring program. So these are for people that are outside the prohibition zone that may have uh, residential wells. So every year, along with the, the County Health Department, we are sampling hundreds of wells uh, to make sure that uh, people are protected. And then, you know, in some cases, every year that gets reviewed. And so depending upon if there are any detections, um, then uh, you know, the sampling frequency may change. Uh, to date, we've, uh, we do have occasionally do have detections, but they are all well below the uh, state criteria, 7.2 parts per billion. I guess the last thing I would say is that uh, you can expect that EGLE will continue to provide oversight at this site <coughs> to ensure compliance by the liable party and to protect public health until such time that uh, EPA takes the lead. Thanks, Mike. And now our Attorney General, Dana Nessel, who I really want to thank for, she said to me, this meeting's important, I'm coming myself. So I want to thank her for that. Thanks. Um, so uh, it's good to be here this uh, evening. Um, you know, I'm here because I know that this is uh, an issue of incredibly great importance to this community. Uh, and also because Debbie Dingle scares me, like, a lot. <laughs> so, um, I just, I, I do want to be honest with you about this. Since I took office in January of 2019, 
Um, you know, Congresswoman Dingell probably calls and texts me about this about once a week. Um, and I decided that the only thing, um, uh, you know, worse than, than not taking Debbie Dingell's <laughs> calls uh, is, well, not taking Debbie Dingell's calls. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, honestly, we've, we've had direct communication for a long time now between um, Congresswoman Dingell and my department. Uh, and, you know, have, we have tried to have, obviously, an open line of communication throughout this entire process, which I know has been incredibly frustrating for everyone. Um, but I, I just want to say, um, I, I sort of have, I have a, um, uh, a little speech here that sort of goes through the last, I don't know, like before Frank Kelly was alive, basically, <laughs> in terms of all the things that have happened with the Gelman site. And I know that you don't want to hear, you know, you don't need a, a history lesson today, you just want answers. So I'm, I'm gonna skip, thank you for putting this together for me, Danielle, by the way, sorry. <laughs> I'm with my uh, uh, assistant AG, Danielle Allison Yoakum, who's here to, to answer questions. Uh, in all candor, um, I tried to be an environmental attorney. I was actually at the Dana School of uh, Natural Resources, not named after me, at the University of Michigan. And then I was like, oh my God, organic chemistry is so hard. I, maybe I'll just practice criminal law. So uh, she's, gonna, she's gonna answer questions on behalf of my department because this is incredibly complicated. There's no question. I know many of you have had to become uh, organic scientists and environmental lawyers, whether you, you wanted to or not, because uh, of how this impacts the communities here in Washington. Um, but all I can tell you is that we are working tirelessly on this at our department, working hand in hand, obviously, with Eagle, with the EPA, uh, and with Congresswoman Dingell, who you could not have a more tenacious advocate working on your behalf in Washington, D.C. And it's not just that she is willing to knock down anybody's door uh, at any time of day or night uh, to ensure that her constituents are safe, but honestly, luckily, she just she knows everybody in D.C. Uh, she has those connections, and that's that's good for, her, for this community, obviously. And, you know, I'm lucky, too, because I'm represented by Congresswoman Dingell. <laughs> so, um, finally, how long did it take? Thank you, Redistricting Commission. <laughs> um, but anyway, with that, I just want to say that I know there's a lot of questions about the new consent judgment. Uh, we want to make sure that, again, we're doing everything to be as helpful as possible in this process and to make sure that the EPA can do what they need to do um, and to always have an open door uh, and be able to listen to the needs and the concerns and the questions that you have about what we're doing at our department. And so that's why I'm here, uh, is to, to listen and to respond to as many questions as we possibly can. And uh, I wanna thank Representative Tingle for inviting me to be here today. Well, oops. Thank you, and I wanna say this about Dana. She does take my calls. Every time one of you has called me, and I look out in this group, and a lot of you have, I call her. And she takes it, we talk it through. Polly is, I think, Polly wishes she didn't see my name, who's uh, uh, her de one of her deputies at the AG's office, who's worked on this for a long time. And I, I wanna say this, everybody really cares. This is one of the most complicated, uh, I mean, it's unacceptable what happened, and no matter what, we're, we're going to get there. It's going to take time. We just need to keep everybody safe. And the good thing, if we go where we think we're going to go, and trust me, I will be, everybody knows what I'm going to be like for the next year, uh, the federal government has more ability to make the polluter pay. And that's exactly what, I'm not going to get in trouble, I don't want to say anything that somehow might end up getting me in trouble, but uh, you all know how I feel. So, and I also want to thank their members of CARD that are here, um, the mayor's environmental commission's got representatives, um, the Huron River Watershed Council, the League of Conservation Waters, Wolfpack. There are a lot of groups that have been engaged and care and are going to stay engaged 
while we get this fixed. So now having said that, I think there are people with mics someplace and let's start moving it. Ask your questions. So raise your hand. There's some over here. Why don't you say who you are, just so people know? Yes, I'm Vince Caruso. I'm a board member of CAR and coordinator member of the Oscar Marsha Group. Um, we've been working on this for a long time. I appreciate the state's effort, local effort. Um, I think we really need to look at um, preserving the quality of life in the area, as well as Michigan. 7.2 is not good enough. And, and we're not even close to that. And I think we need, as a state, to take the you know, bull by the horn and go back to the days when we had polluter pay legislation, more environmentally aware um, politicians. I think we have you know split the state. We have Democrats in control now. We need to take advantage of that situation and lower the standards so that people are not being contaminated by the drinking water. EPA. Uh, has, a, has a number of 0.35 part per billion uh, as, a, as a target, more or less. Uh, the Environmental Working Group is 0.3 part per billion for one in a million cancer risk. That is almost a national standard, pretty much. So we need to work on that and move forward, have politicians who are willing to step up and do the right thing and not just keep kicking the can down the road. And I think um, we can get it done, and I think we deserve that. And our taxpayer dollars are paying your salaries, and we need to get some action. So thank you so much. So I want to say that I'm going to let Tim maybe talk about what's going on at the federal level. I should have said this at the very beginning, and I apologize. This is what happens when you go from your heart. All of the state legislators for this area were going to be here and they are in Lansing. It's the last day. They're working on the budget. They're getting money for you for other projects for this area, and they could not be here. But every last one of them wanted to be here. Uh, and this, quite frankly, the legislators that you have from Washtenaw County are the leaders in the state legislature who have tried for years to get polluter pay legislation through. So, you know, the problem is you, you all should keep talking about it, trying to push it. Your legislators aren't the problem. Um, I mean, that is, this is an area that, Dana? I just, we just had some excellent legislation passed today repealing the no stricter than federal um, law that had been put in place during the lame duck era of the Snyder administration. So, I mean, that is a start, and that's substantial, and that's impactful. So I just want people to know that, you know, I, and I fully expect, I shouldn't, I, I have not talked to the governor. I have a hard time believing she's not going to sign that. So that is definitely a step in the right direction, and I don't think we've seen the last of good uh, environmental policy being put in place by the legislature. And I'll, I'll give you one of the, uh, it's a different pollutant, but PFAS, you know, I, I, which is a forever chemical. I've not given up fighting on PFAS since I walked into the United States Congress. I've gotten the PFAS action bill passed through the House multiple times since the United States Senate. That's always a problem. But we only have a, um, at the federal level, although EPA is listening, so I don't want to, I got to give you a tip. I have to say that Michael Regan and I, Michael has a PFAS working group and we're working on this, but for years there was only guidance on the PFAS water standard. And Rick Snyder put in place a standard that was stricter than the federal level guidance. So uh, that's one of the reasons that, because this would, the bill that they passed would actually, that PFAS is another very serious contaminant. So it is progress, and I do know, I've talked to um, everybody that they are trying to get the polluter pay laws and make that more stringent. Tim, did you want to make any comments about? 
Well, yeah, I, I guess I'll just say, I, yes, the circle statute is a very strong uh, authority, and it, it, it provides a lot of authority for us to require responsible parties to take action, and if they won't do it, it allows us the opportunity to take the lead as an agency, and then they'll have to reimburse us for the costs that we incur. So CERCLA is a very strong statute that allows us to take action at sites on the MPL. Uh, with respect to the number uh, that you talked about with 1,4-Dioxane, uh, I'll just say obviously it's premature for us to know what we're going to clean the site up to because we'll have to go through an extensive remedial investigation process, a risk assessment process. We have a mandate though under law, our remedies have to be protective. So we will ensure that whatever cleanup concentration we pick is protective of human health and the environment. Uh, and we also tend to, if, if the state standard is protective, uh, we have something we call ARARS, it's a technical term in the Superfund program. Uh, we generally clean up to drinking water standards and if the state has a more stringent standard than the federal government, we will clean up to the state standard. So. So we're going to, and I work very cl closely with the environmental working group too on a number of, just so you know that. Where are we going over here? Um, my name is James Demore, and I am a vice chair of the State Political Committee for the Michigan chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, in 2016, uh, I was a, a member of the Sierra Club here in Valley Group uh, Executive Committee, and we were one of the uh, entities that uh, petitioned uh, the U.S. EPA uh, that, uh, to uh, request that the uh, Gamma Bloom be determined as a, uh, a Superfund site. Um, we felt at the time that uh, state and local remedies weren't working. I can say uh, with frankness that some of the people even in the room were uh, resisting uh, such an effort, but we felt that uh, federal involvement uh, needed to happen and we're glad to see the uh, begin and the end result of the, or the end of the beginning uh, with respect uh, to that issue. Uh, I will say comfortably on behalf of Michigan Sierra Club, we do support a strong polluted pay legislation. We hope to see that introduced in the coming months. Um, my question really is, and let me make sure I understand the process, and, uh, and thank you very much for uh, explaining the circle law to some extent uh, to the, uh, the end product. But my question is, what happens uh, again after the uh, comment period, after the preliminary investigation is done? Is there a comment period in the Federal Register and then uh, individuals and the public and agencies can weigh in on that? Can you explain that a little bit further? And once that's passed, and once you do determine, yes, um, it meets the standards, we go have a super fund, what exactly happens? Thank you. So I'm going to start the answer, and then I'm probably going to turn it over to Nuria because she's our Nuria Muniz is our MPL coordinator for the state of Michigan, and she's sort of the project manager for this. Um, yeah, so we're developing a, a, a record. Much of what we do at EPA in terms of decision making, we have to really build a robust. Uh, administrative record to support our decision making because a lot of what we decide is is potentially subject to legal challenge or technical challenge and so we really have to make sure we dot the i's and cross the t's and put together a good record for what we are proposing to do so the next step after completing the site inspection we're going to conduct this additional sampling this summer uh, collect that data put together a document record uh, if we determine the site is eligible for proposal to the MPL, uh, we'll put that record together. It will become part of a federal rule, rulemaking process, uh, assuming we have, uh, again, approval from EPA headquarters and the administrator's office and the state of Michigan. Uh, and then the, through the rulemaking process, we will propose in the federal register uh, that the Gelman site be added to the national priorities list. And that will be the step where the public has an opportunity to comment on that proposal. Uh, and then determination will be made based upon those comments whether we move forward and finalize the site to the MPL. Anything I missed, Nuria? So there's a, a 60 day comment period after, after we, we propose. So you have 60 days to comment and um, we have to address any substantial comment that comes in. Anything that would anything that would affect the score that it that um, decision.
disrupts our argument of listing the site, we have to address. If, for example, the site doesn't score after we look at these different comments, then we would have to start all over again. If we are able to address all of those comments, we move forward. So it usually takes, so we get those 60 days and we have basically um, between the day it's proposed to the day we go into the final rule, it's about six months. <clears throat> so we had try to address all our comments in those six months and then becomes final. Final to the NPL means the site is a super fund. There's 90 days um, to, for any further litigation. Yeah, and so the, the docket contains our, our basis, our supporting documentation to um, indicating why we feel like it's appropriate to propose the site to the NPL. And as Nuria alluded to, uh, folks have an opportunity to provide additional information as part of that comment period that we have to consider in, in determining whether or not we need to adjust our analysis, right? So, yeah. I'm going to say something carefully, or say Chris Taylor's my lawyer, I'll put a penny on the table, um, <laughs> that this has been a very litigious site. So you all can just think about who you know is likely to try to raise issues. This is a time for this community when that, if that happens, when that happens, uh, that you are loud and clear in that rulemaking and getting to your comments in and, and supporting the documentation. And that is why there's even, look, we know what this site's been like, so EPA is making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. So as we move forward, we are prepared for troublemakers. Probably got in trouble, but. That's well said. <laughs> Well, my name is Tim Mortimer. I am a citizen. Uh, I have a question concerning the 7.2 PVB uh, zone. Um, it's a simple question. I'm not terribly f familiar with the uh, details of the situation, although uh, it does irritate me a lot, as you described. Um, what's the shortest distance between the perimeter of the zone and the river of the Huron River? Right now, do you know? Uh, I don't know. It's probably, uh, what you're asking is yes. what is the distance between the 7.2 criteria right. The and, right. and the and the <coughs> and the Huron River? Any point on the river, river, whatever the closest distance is. Hang on, okay. we're bringing a mic. Well, you're, when you reference the Huron River, there's right. two different criteria that we're talking about. The 7.2 is a drinking water criteria, right. and the and to the Huron River, it's a, a groundwater surface water interface criteria, and that's 280 parts per billion. It's allowed to vent into the Huron River. Okay. So the shortest distance from the 7.2 to a drinking water well, it's, it's going to be probably uh, less than half a mile, something like that. Uh, to that we have information that way. To the 7-2, you know, we have, there has been detections, as was mentioned tonight, of much lower in, res, in, in water wells, but uh, to the 7-2, I'm thinking it's, uh, you know, approximately uh, one half plus or minus miles. Okay, let me formulate the question a little more exactly. Then. What's the shortest distance between the perimeter of the zone and any physically visible part of the area? Uh, that shortest distance of, that's probably uh, in the order of magnitude of probably a quarter mile because uh, we have low concentrations out uh, much further, quarter mile or a half mile, depending on which direction you're going. So. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming too. Please, so thank I, you. I'm gonna take that question and ask you to go a little further because I've had this question asked of me okay. in the last week. And the kind of, how are you ensuring that the Huron River stays safe as water travels downriver, and that it's safe from the dikes. How are we ensuring? Well, yes. I mean, and it is. are we? It's a, I mean, because people are worried. So let's take that. You we were have, dancing that question. I'm asking it head on. We have uh, several things were mentioned tonight. Some activities that we do. We do a yearly sampling in residential wells to the north, to the south, uh, to the to the west. 
it, within the prohibition zone, which is more the east to the Huron River, there, we don't sample uh, <coughs> residential wells in there because no one, there is no residential wells in there. We sample residential wells uh, each year. This year, there was approximately 244 that were proposed. I think they just finished up, they finished up in June, and there was about 205, 204 wells where samples were collected. Another, another aspect of that is under the cons consent judgment, Gelman is required to sample monitoring wells at certain frequencies. There are approximately, with the, all the new wells and several new ones that will be coming, be being installed, there are approximately 200, uh, you know, approaching 300 monitoring wells in, you know, as part of the Gelman site. So those, those are sampled and evaluated, you know, uh, depending on how often. Uh, the shortest is once a month, uh, the longest is every couple of years. So we evaluate uh, all those monitoring wells. So those are the two main issues, uh, and then uh, two main issues, and then we also are extracting groundwater, and they're treating groundwater. So that con those concentrations of it, that extraction groundwater is also monitored monthly under an, a national permit, an ADES permit. Is anybody sampling the river? Uh, or Ann Arbor drinking water? Why don't you just tell them who you are? I think they figured out you're from Eagle, but why don't you tell them? <laughs> My name is Dan Hamill. I'm the Eagle project manager, the day-to-day -day project manager in the Jackson district. So I would be the first contact in Jackson. Uh, you know, I work uh, most closely with uh, Gellman day-to-day. Uh, so uh, uh, I forgot the question, though. What was the... Uh, 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 does anybody say the river? river? Is, it and the, drinking water. is anyone sampling the Huron River? The Huron River is is sampled by by San uh, 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 Arbor. We have uh, we have we sample the surface waters around the Huron River that go into that uh, once a year. We've been doing that consistently in the last couple of years, uh, including uh, like I said, uh, surface uh, surface water streams, uh, the uh, Allen Creek. Uh, drain and so we have done that. You understand the citizens' concern. Absolutely, absolutely. The, you know your drinking water uh, at Barton Pond, which is part of the Heron River, it gets uh, gets. I think you get 80 percent. Are all the concentrations below 7.2 ppb? Yes, all all the concentrations are below 7. .2. Well, we all know. Well, the okay. I, I'm going to caveat that all concentrations in what I would call. Uh, streams are, are below 7.2. We have sampled the Allen Creek drain, and uh, and that has ranged, I think we started several years ago, that has ranged uh, approximately 10 parts per billion, but uh, last uh, uh, two years ago or so, there was 45 parts per billion. Again, realize that is a drain that's right. not necessarily, you know, it gets influenced by groundwater, but it also has surface, surface drainage. Uh, right, and 7.2 is controversial. It's high compared to 0 0.3 or 0 0.5. Right, uh, but it's a uh, you know under under the Part 201 regulations, uh, the the risk the, that is uh, the reason is 72. The risk that was calculated, it's uh, it, it's one in 100,000 is the risk in Michigan. The uh, the, the 0.35 was a risk of the DPA's risk range. That's their lowest risk, and that's one in one million. You know, so that's that's some differences in the numbers. So, Michigan under our environmental law, it's uh, one in one hundred thousand. I'm going to ask one more question because I hear it from everybody, and I want everybody's questions answered tonight. So we know we're on a path. Um, Chris, I don't know who you want to answer this question, but people worry about Barton Pond, which is part of, and the city is testing. You've got one of the best water systems, the, the director of the water system, and you are, I talk to Chris all the time about how they are making sure their water is safe. So that you also test to make sure, I don't know if you wanna. I mean, just uh, broadly speaking, Ann Arbor drinking water is tested several, uh, you know, many thousands of times per year. Uh, we are testing for, uh, Ann Arbor's drinking water is tested uh, you know, numerous times a day, thousand times per year. We are testing constantly for uh, one for dioxin as well as for uh, a variety of other potential contaminants to ensure that we comply with all existing regulations. Uh, we publish that information consistently uh, on our website. You can check it out uh, both presently and historically. I'm, I'm letting you all figure out who you're giving the mic to. Who's got it now? Okay. Hi, thank you very much, um, all of you, for being here. My name is Janet Fisher. I live in Ann Arbor. And I have a two-part question, or maybe it's more of a 
single question with a two-part answer, but I want two distinct answers. The first part of my question is technical, and it's about containment. And just from the get-go with this situation, we all knew it was really important to do something to keep the plume from spreading. So my question is, is there anything technically at this point in the process that's possible to be done to keep the plume from spreading further? And the second part of the question, or the second way I would ask it, is given all of the complexity we've, we've just heard about of oversight of authority and responsibility of, of who's in control of who pays, all of that stuff, given all of that, is there anything that can be done to intervene at this point to keep the plume from spreading farther? Including the two experts. Well, you know, there's always more uh, uh, source removal and part of the Fourth Amendment consent judgment. There is a, uh, two additional uh, wells that have been put in place to do more mass removal. So that's part of the uh, consent judgment. So, um, you know, more systems, more removal, you know, could be, could be put in place. That's not required under the consent judgment. So those, um, the, the two most recent wells are in some of the hottest uh, areas, so we feel like they're getting probably as much mass removal as they can at some point. So is there some misunderstanding, like more wells would do more, but you know, you have to, you have to go to where the, where you see the hottest, because sometimes, you know, if you're pumping, the contamination may not be flowing there, you're just pumping water, and so you can, you know, talk pumping rates and that sort of thing, but there is a little bit more, a little more nuanced in that regard. Um, and the second part of your question was, I'm sorry. <laughs> The second part was what would it take um, if, if it was what would it take to actually put in place say the extra wells you just talked about or some other mechanism to pull out some of the pollution some of the dioxane in a way that would keep the plume from spreading further and contaminating more groundwater and potentially surface water. Uh, that, that's probably a longer uh, technical discussion, but that's par part of the reason we got here um, with the prohibition zone. It's kind of this containment uh, strategy is that there's there's a difficulty getting access and, and putting, you know, like if this was just a flat piece of land out here and we did, just could drop anything in we wanted or do whatever we, we needed to do and no roads and no homes in the way and things like that, you know, life would be easier. So, but there are some, that's kind of how we got here to begin with. That's probably a very unsatisfying answer, but I'm really good at giving those, uh, these sorts of meetings. So. <laughs> 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 Congresswoman Daniel said it's been 40 years. Correct. And at the very beginning, that was the big concern was keeping this plume from spreading. And so naturally, people are upset and frustrated and concerned. Yeah, we understand. So if EPA lists this on the national priority site, Tim, would you be able to take further action? Well, so I, I want to be clear that e even if the site is listed on the MPL, we would have to undergo a very thorough, extensive remedial investigation and feasibility, what we call feasibility study, where we analyze different alternatives to address the contamination concerns at the site. And that typically takes us four to six years to get through that process before we select a remedy for a site. Um, it, it could be a combination of different kinds of remedies, uh, but it would be premature for me to suppose, presuppose it would be containment. There are treatment options at sites where we can inject chemicals into the aquifer and break down contaminants. Uh, there are uh, thermal treatment remedies that we've implemented at sites with chlorinated VOCs. So there, there are a lot of different alternatives that we would have to look at before we decide on what the right approach is at Gelman. But I would reiterate that as we move through that process of conducting the investigation, the feasibility study, at any time if we receive data that indicates that there's an imminent substantial endangerment to anyone, we would involve our emergency response program and take immediate action. I think that's something that's really important to, that as people have seen it spread a little, that EPA is on that right now. So, well, that is an issue. I'm, I'm gonna, this is what I said to you all when I started digging this is when I got elected. If we had done this 20 years ago, we would be, but we are where we are and we're making progress. That's what you gotta, you can't look back. I could say a lot of things, but we gotta look forward now. 
And uh, the one thing I want to, I talk to everybody about this, everybody here, all of the, how do we make sure we're keeping this from spreading, nobody's in danger, and it's gonna take a while to get this cleaned up. It's not a dioxin plume, it's damn tough to clean up. It's hard, it requires real know-how. But everybody is devoted to keeping everybody safe as is, we're going through this. I don't know who's got a, the answer. Good evening, we're not going to forget some. This he needs to get one up at some point. Thank you, Debbie, for hosting this forum. Uh, my name is Dan Bicknell. I'm a longtime resident of Washington County and president of the Global Environmental Alliance. Um, I have I have comments um, in that I support the federal U.S. EPA take over the Gelman site by creating a Gelman Science U.S. EPA Superfund site. This is because, as Debbie indicates, in the past 38 years, we've really not been able to protect the public health by stopping the Gelman dioxin plume from expanding and degrading our drinking water. In particular, the new Fourth Amendment consent judgment referenced here allows for the placement of old, excuse me, allows for the placement of land use restrictions and institutional controls on private land whose drinking water wells become contaminated this is done instead of requiring active cleanup of the groundwater so that a property owner may safely drink water from their well. Recently, studies by Sio Township and Ann Arbor Charter Township have identified 27 contaminated drinking water wells over one mile from the consent judgment established boundary. Yet the new Fourth Amendment consent judgment includes no additional monitoring wells to delineate the extent and magnitude of the dioxin plume about these impacted residential neighborhoods. Nor does it require Gelman to pay for residential drinking water supply uh, sampling. That's been paid for by the state. The fourth amended consent judgment requires approximately 476 gallons per minute of groundwater to be extracted. However, currently, underneath the last third amended consent judgment, there was 442 gallons per minute required. This little difference is, is what you see in the difference between the third and the fourth amendment consent judgment. Very little difference in the amount of groundwater that's being extracted. In fact, the pumping rate has not stopped the dioxin plume migration and it will not in the future. So in summary, the new fourth amendment consent judgment allows the dioxin groundwater plume to migrate towards residential properties and the Huron River thereby contaminating private drinking water wells and potentially hardened pun. The new fourth amended consent judgment is not consistent with existing laws and regulations or sound engineering practices. This fourth amended consent judgment itself presents an imminent and substantial endangerment to public health and the environment. And I am glad that you all can be here, particularly US EPA, to hear all of our comments and concerns because this administrative order is not something that's protecting public health. Thank Danielle, you. do you want to start? And then we'll... So I think that um, Mike has already spoke a little bit to the, um, the placement of the new extraction wells, but those are being focused, understanding that the point is not to withdraw as much water as possible, but to withdraw as much contaminants as possible. So the placement of those wells is put in places where we think we're going to draw out more mass of the contaminant plume and have a greater effect on preventing the continued expansion. With all due respect, my only comment remaining is that in those wells that you in those wells in those wells that you're referencing, the consent judgment requires only that you pump two gallons per minute from those hot zone contaminated wells why the operation of the other wells is in place. The only way that those wells, those hot zone wells, will work is if you drop the existing pumping tree of two major wells that are protecting the city of Ann Arbor and Ann Arbor Township. So you two gallons per minute, which is required underneath the consent judgment, all required under only required under the consent judgment, is all you get out of those required wells underneath the consent judgment. It's not a panacea, it's not going to meaningfully impact the contamination. The, this contamination has been and it continues to be allowed to spread. And rather than address it, you are simply expanding the prohibition zone. You're allowing Yellman to apply land use restrictions, institutional controls, as the plume expands, thereby limiting exposure. 
What you're not doing is you're not stopping the plume from migrating. Thank you. I'll let Mike follow up here in just a second, but I'd also like to add that institutional controls are one of the things that the legislature has allowed us to use to control, or has allowed liable parties to use to control plumes. Dating back to the 1990s, when the state tried to take very aggressive action against Gelman in order to have them pump and treat more of this contaminant plume, the court is the one who originally imposed the prohibition zone. So that is the consent judgment that we have been stuck, the situation that we've been stuck with since the 90s. We, are, we have tried to um, do more, but we are limited by what our laws allow us to do. So. Yeah, I, I think you're misrepresenting the situation a little bit, Dan. Um, you know, the, when you say two gallons per minute, because they're pumping on those wells, it's 50 gallons per minute is what they're currently pumping. So, and it's all based on a performance objective that, that's outlined in the consent judgment. You're referencing the Rose Well, or IW2, as the new well that you're going to be installed. That well uh, is only allowed underneath the consent judgment to pump two gallons per minute. The requirement for all of the Evergreen and Maple Road wells is 200 gallons per minute. Currently, you're pumping 198 gallons per minute. <coughs> so to comply with the consent judgment, the difference is 198 minus 200. You only have, under the consent judgment, oh, you're two gallons. In your no, no, I'm not. I, I see Dan shaking his head. But that's not, <laughs> that's not the correct information. And okay. you, need to, you need to really look at what was signed. And what was signed is that you have to collect 200 gallons per minute. Currently, you're pumping 198. That leaves two gallons per minute for your rose well. If you want to drop off the collection of the two other wells, like TW23 and 29, which are protecting the city, okay, which pump around 100 gallons per minute, you can do that and increase the rose well. But that allows the plume to migrate. You have no relief. You have no ability, and it hasn't, and it isn't in this consent judgment going to be any containment of the plume. The plume is just meandering where it wants. It's meandered over inside the township and Arbor Charter Township. Unfortunately, that's why we're here, Yash, because this is a flawed administrative order. You are agreeing to what Gelman is asking for instead of demanding what is required. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I appreciate your perspective. I think that the state Thank views you. this differently. Um, I think that we are working with a consent judgment and years of litigation behind us that has led us to this point. And our hands are somewhat tied by, about what we can do going forward. Um, the prohibition zone was nobody's first option. Allowing the, the plume to continue to expand was nobody's first option. But given the decisions that we've already faced, that's where we're at. Remember, there have been court decisions that all of us don't agree with. I have was, a, I mean, there was a gag order, so I don't know everything that happened. I wasn't a party to the suit. But uh, there, there been, I mean, I can get so angry about what did or did not happen going back to the 90s as you study all of this. But this is why you do need, as Vince says, stronger state legislation. You do, the courts have rejected stronger the consent decrees that people have tried to get. That's one of the reasons that, and quite frankly, I'm going to be blunt. There were years not under Governor Whitmer when the, the four communities said, can we, will you please request the listing on the national priority site? Look, it wasn't my, but there were people that didn't want that to happen, and the governor said, I'm listening to the communities, and I'm doing what they want to do. And everybody wanted to go in that direction. But there are laws and consent decrees that limit where we are at right now. And nobody's happy about it, but it's the reality because, uh, I mean, quite frankly, again, I'm going to try not to get in trouble, so I don't. But we are where we are because there's a certain polluter that has really tried to get everybody where we are. I'll only go that far. Who's next? Sure, and you, uh, Randall Gang, you mentioned the consent decree a bunch of times, and even though we may have redistricted AG Nessel into your district, we didn't change the appeals court. 
is still gerrymandered. And I think we're here today because the Ng report cut the legs out from under individual citizens' right to environmental protections. What do we do, this question for A.G. Haskell, what can we do as individual citizens to prepare for the litigation that's coming? Even if we pass laws today, legislation that addresses this specifically, it's still going to court. What can we do to protect for that? Well, first of all, let me, let me just say this in regard to some of the concerns about the consent judgment, the fourth amended consent judgment. Um, and, you know, in all candor, it is, it is hard for me to keep up with a lot of the scientific uh, terminology that everyone is using. I know that you guys have like been eating, breathing, living this plume for 40 years. And so you're, you know, obviously very well educated about all of the specifics. And, you know, I, I will concede, I, um, I do not have all of the information that many of you have, but I'm going to say this. Um, I have been on my staff since I entered office. And again, I've been talking with Congresswoman Dingell about this on a regular basis. Um, I have been um, aggressive with my department about ensuring that we are doing everything that we possibly can within the bounds of the law. Uh, anybody that knows me, anybody that's followed me um, throughout the course of my time in office, I take issues involving uh, our water supply very, very seriously. I feel like I have tried to uh, fulfill all my commitments in regard to the PFAS litigation, in regard to Enbridge Line 5, in regards to you know multiple CAVO, CAVO suits that we've filed all across the state of Michigan. All we can do is be as aggressive as we possibly can within the boundaries of, again, what the courts will allow and um, what my department and Eagle are permitted to do. Uh, and, and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, I also will tell you this, we routinely, I know we had a gentleman who was affiliated with the Sierra Club. I have meetings uh, on a regular basis with uh, Michigan LCB and the Sierra Club and Clean Water Action, and we take their advice. We sit down with their lawyers and say, what more could we be doing? You know, if you have, if you have advice for us about something that we could do in addition to what we're trying to do already, I will take your advice. Uh, and we bring them into the conversation because I wanna make sure, as great as I think my attorneys are, and I really do have a lot of respect. I, I didn't walk into the office. I didn't know what I was walking into. It was 16 years of Republican administrations that I thought didn't care very much about environmental issues. No offense to you guys. Um, but in four and a half years, I am convinced that I do have some of the best environmental lawyers uh, in the state, maybe in the country, and that they are working as hard as they can. We are open to suggestions uh, if there are uh, other ways that we can possibly proceed on this, but I mean, we've talked it over and over and over again, and I don't think that there's anything more that we can do in regard to, again, this, this consent judgment that was most recently entered into. Um, but Daniel, do you wanna? What can be reviewed on the courts? No, right, I, know. I was just getting all of that out. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, firstly, obviously, our, our you know, state courts are, these are elected positions. They're not uh, appointed in there for life. I think it's very important that people, um, you know, remain cognizant. I mean, most people don't know who was on the Court of Appeals at all. Um, most people can't name a single um, judge on the Court of Appeals, and I think it's something that people have to pay much closer attention to than we have in the past. But again, we do have um, a once in a 40 year opportunity for better laws in the state. And again, I mean, I do think it's fair for us to be pushing as hard as we can to ensure that we have the very best laws in place that will allow for my department to do more, to allow Equal to do more. Uh, and, you know, those are those are things that we're gonna continue to press on um, and to remain involved. Um, I, I will say a few things just real quickly. You know, we, we don't have 
We have caucuses, we have a caucus in the, uh, in the state house right now that I think wants to do a lot more. I don't know how much longer that's gonna be the case that Democrats are in the majority in the house. We have two um, members that are running for their local mayoral offices. Um, it is, is likely that at least one of them will win and if so, the Democrats, as of the November election this year, will no longer have majority uh, until there is a special election uh, and it's the governor who will decide what exactly that's gonna be. Um, but there will be a time period where the Democrats won't be a majority anymore and that's gonna happen soon. So there's not, there's not a lot of time to get some of this legislation through and I would encourage everyone uh, to be talking to their state reps and their state senators to see how much can be done between now and the November election, when again, we may have a period of time where we won't have that opportunity. And I wanted to, you saw Robbie came in, by the way, when he was in the legislature, he tried to get polluter pay legislation. <coughs> we have, your Washington legislators have tried, so. I need to say that now he is the Washtenaw County Commissioner that is the liaison to CART as well. So I just, I want to say that. So I want to thank you. Do any of you want to say anything else? Or, there are a lot of questions out here. Um, I, I can get a mic. Oh, okay, Mike, you'll be after. Thank you. Oh, hi, um, my name is Robin Lucy and I am an opera citizen. I'm also a graduate student at the School of uh, Social Work and Public Health um, at University of Michigan. Hi, Justin. Uh, <laughs> also one of the students. Um, so my biggest concern is I don't really understand most of the technical things that are being said right here. Um, but my biggest, biggest concern, especially with being um, in social work is people. And I wanna know, and I don't, I grew up in Southeast Michigan. I'm not, I've only lived in Ann Arbor for about a year. Um, and I just wanna know like what has been done and what's being done and what is being planned to ensure that equity is reached with um, marginalized groups within the county, within the state, the people that are being affected the most. And by marginalized, I mean, um, people that are low income, people that don't own their homes, uh, that are underinsured or uninsured. And by and I mean, I want to be clear on the difference between equity and equality. So it's a loaded question, but I'd just like to know what's being done, what's being planned, or what has been done. I'll give it a shot and see if I can answer it and hit the points that you've asked about. And if I miss it, maybe someone else on this panel can help me get up. Okay. Um, from our, the, the way that we are handling this is by following the contamination. So um, we want everyone to have safe drinking water in this area, regardless of which income group or what their background is, everyone to have safe drinking water. And so the goal is to, with the seven, the reduction to 7.2 parts per billion, is to ensure everyone's drinking safer water than before, um, because before it was at 84, 85 parts per billion. And then to put in place mechanisms that if we see exceedances coming, that um, action is taken. So under the consent judgment, if a well is found with three parts per billion in it, then there are requirements that bottled water be provided to that home or homeowner or whoever it is who's affected by that immediately. And additional steps then are explored to address that. But I don't know that there's any, we're trying to treat everyone who's affected by the plume in the same manner um, to make sure everyone is safe. I hope that helped, I'm not sure. <laughs> kind of. I mean, I mean, I'm less concerned with um, bottled water and treating everyone the same because not everyone's at the same level. Um, not everyone's at the same level of being able to bounce back from that. Um, bottled water can only go so far. Um, it's, it's a loaded question, I know, but something to at least think about and really consider too because, I mean, Washtenaw County, I'm gonna be honest, we have a very concentrated 
um, of affluent people who can go buy bottled water, who can buy water purifiers, who can do all this thing. And, and there are people that don't. And people who don't own where they're, they're, they don't control what goes into their home. They don't necessarily have as much of a choice. They don't have time to come to these meetings. Not only time, but they can't get to these meetings. So thinking about those people who are even on the same level. So it's more than just a water bottle. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I did. I certainly did not mean to oh, no. minimize. <laughs> okay. Um, but when we say provision of bottled water, we mean that Gelman will provide bottled water, not that a homeowner would. And yeah. obviously, these environmental impacts can impact different people in different ways. Um, I know and I have confidence that Eagle is working hard to address environmental justice issues to ensure that we are, we are looking at all communities and making sure that they are not overly impacted by environmental contamination. Okay, here and then Michael Moran. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Gordon Bigelow. I live in Ann Arbor. I've been here for 27 years and I don't want to die here from drinking the water. Um, I think that the, what all of your, what you're discussing uh, hinges on the toxicity of 1,4-dioxane. And I know that when I wanted to use 1,4-dioxane in my research because it closely mimics water in its properties, I had to go to a Russian journal of physical chemistry to find out. Well, I wonder what the latest work is that has been done on toxicity of 1,4-dioxane and whether it would be fruitful for the state to fund a study by the toxicology department of the University of Michigan to look into what we're really dealing with here because everything, all these levels of, of uh, contamination hinge on how toxic this substance is. So can you tell me what you know about this and just how it uh, relates to the levels of contamination that we're talking about? I yeah, I'm not a classicologist, so I would, uh, I would be wary about uh, treading into the toxicity and that sort of thing. The, 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 um, it's believed to be a carcinogen and so at the levels that we're talking about, uh, there's uh, toxicologists uh, do those calculations to determine what's an acceptable drinking water level or not. As you've heard before, there's many people that say that the state of Michigan level is not uh, uh, low enough. So uh, by, by law, when we do uh, toxicity values or criteria, one of the differences that you see like between us and the EPA is the cancer risk uh, uh, calculation is one in 100,000 in the state of Michigan when they calculate levels. And for EPA, for example, it's one in a million. So that gives you that factor of 10. So that's the big driver and the difference in the numbers that you see state to state. Do you know what those data are based on? Uh, whose study and where the study was done? I, I don't know. I can't cite you the studies. I mean, the EPA and other, other uh, people have done study. And when tox toxicologists review those those things, they look at the most recent uh, toxicity studies that are out there. And I do not know what's the most recent or how, how often those are done. I'm sorry. Can we get that information for you? And I, I well, I, I, don't, I don't think that, I, I, as, as you say, the, the level of contamination is, or, or the level of toxicity is, um, is not at all well decided. And so that there, there is much to be, um, to be studied yet. And further, it's not just the concern for human health, but also the concern for the environment in general having this contamination in the groundwater. Yes. So, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't probably, I can't answer your question as far as what you're looking for in toxicity studies. We've got some experts, Mike Moran. So. Um, thank you. I'm Mike Moran. I'm uh, Ann Arbor Township uh, trustee, previously was supervisor for about 18 years, 16 of them dealing with this problem. 
I'm also a lawyer. Um, the, uh, it's true, as has been said here, that we are hamstrung by Michigan law. But there is a whole lot more going on in the representation that this community has gotten or not gotten from EGLE and um, those representing EGLE um, than has been stated so far. Dan has been able to outline some of the really terrible things that are in the current uh, fourth consent judgment. Um, many of you probably know that there was a previous version of that consent judgment, which every local jurisdiction here rejected as being completely insufficient to protect the, our, our own residents and the community at large. This consent judgment also uh, consent ju now uh, officially consent judgment for has been rushed into uh, negotiation and it has many terrible defects and uh, in addition to the one Stan wanted Dan outlined I wanted to just outline to one uh, to you Ms. Nessel I don't know what you say to your legal staff but I do know that there are some things going on here that disadvantage us that is not set in Michigan law. So for example, if we take the um, proposed consent judgment that we all rejected and we put it into Microsoft and we compare it to the one that was already now signed on May 19th without any negotiation with any of these communities or with any of the parties that intervened in this lawsuit, we can see what the differences are. And just to give you an example, that's a legal difference. Um, on this pro uh, prohibition zone issue, uh, the prohibition zone has been expanded several times. The difference, if, if you compare these two versions of the consent judgments, the one we rejected and the one that's been adopted without our participation, you can see that a very important uh, provision has been eliminated from how we allow the prohibition zone to expand. Previously, under the old proposed consent judgment four, there was a goal to not allow the plume to expand eastward beyond Maple Road. And there was also this prohibition zone, which basically is a highway to dump the pollution into, or allow it to run into, and allow it to run downstream where it's somebody else's problem. Yeah. That is also an unconscionable um, goal I think and so but I would what I wanted to focus on just to give you an idea is it used to be that to expand the prohibition zone there had to be a showing of compelling reasons by clear and convincing evidence that's the strongest standard basically you could get in civil law clear and convincing evidence it's akin to proof beyond a reasonable doubt but if you look at the one that's been adopted the standard has been removed so now it's a mere preponderance of evidence, the weakest standard used in civil law that allows the prohibition to expand. That has nothing to do with Michigan law. It has to do with what was negotiated and put into place. So we have a lot of problems here. We have the problem of the fourth consent judgment, which in itself is ineffective, and we have um, a lack of enforcement that uh, continues. those comments. Um, if you'll recall the, the consent judgment that was rejected by your local units of government were um, negotiated with local units of government and also contained additional um, concessions from the locals in exchange for some of the additional asks in the consent judgment. When the state of Michigan and Eagle and the Department of Attorney in General supported the entry of the consent judgment as it was originally negotiated when Judge Connors entered it. And then we supported that it still be enforced when it went to the Court of Appeals. What happened at the Court of Appeals is that the Court of Appeals vacated that decision of Judge Connors and directed that the parties negotiate and the parties being the state and Gelman negotiate together to get to a consent judgment. By the time that happened, we had been with the outdated criteria for 1,4 dioxin for nearly a decade. Josh, is that correct? 
2017. So for five, six years, we've been allowing Glowman to operate under consent judgment that allows them to have 85 parts per billion in drinking water and 2,800 parts per billion as a GSI criteria. That had been going on for a number of years. We needed to get into consent judgment. We no longer had some of the concessions that the community made to make to Gelman to get those additional things that were that resulted in those differences between the final consent judgment that was entered and the consent judgment that was negotiated with the interveners. Again, an unfortunate occurrence given that the court made a decision that it was going to kick what had been negotiated before. And we're stuck in that position. Hey, who, I know we've got a lot of questions and we're gonna, um, are you guys okay if we stay a little? Oh, Danielle, did you wanna say one more thing? Yeah, I'll say one more thing. And um, it is unfortunate, I, I, I probably point to ask Brian to talk about um, why the clear and convincing standard was removed, but the compelling reasons still require that Gelman make a showing to the court that either the plume, the um, criteria has been lowered, or whatever the other compelling reasons under the consent judgment are have been made. Thanks, my, name is, it's, uh, uh, my name is Michael Rapsuri, and I'm a Old West Side resident of Ann Arbor. Uh, Congresswoman Dingell, I regret to confess that the last time I was with you in person, was in 2016 at Eber White School. Can I see a show of hands who was there at that meeting? I don't know a speck uh, about this issue compared to most of the people here. I went to that meeting because I've got young children. I came back uh, and wrote a letter to the president of the University of Michigan. And so I want to make two points to you about political willpower because I think you need political willpower to make headway with this. One is that in the letter I wrote to Mark Schlissel was that, did he understand what was going on with this problem? He was new to the community. Did he understand the ramifications for the University of Michigan? If in trying to recruit talent to come to the university or otherwise, people will say, oh, you know, it's too bad about that water in <clears throat> I tried to appeal to his business interests, and I don't know if there's anybody from the university here, but I would propose to you that you recruit the new president as a big gorilla to throw its weight behind what needs to get moved to move this thing faster. The other point about political willpower I would offer is I don't know how many people understand that at the time Gilman was spraying the dioxane out on the grass, that the Dow Chemical Company had offered to take it back for a cost so they wouldn't have to spray it all over the fields and we wouldn't have a plume. I don't know how well known that is, but it certainly pisses me off. And if we need to motivate people to get after whoever we have to get after, I think that's something that should be shared with citizens often because it really is unconscionable. So I hope before November, we can get some political will. I'm with a fellow in the blue shirt who said, what, what can we do? We need direction. We need to know how to organize it, who to go after and what to do. And I, I know you're making recommendations along those lines, but we, we need we need them from you. Thank you. So I'm gonna take that question. I'm gonna say that when I first got elected, which was eight years ago, all I saw was four communities that didn't agree on anything. Card that was saying this and that. EPA who I, I if anybody's been engaged in this for, for that meeting, you remember EPA said it'll take forever, we can never do it. And I kept saying then, okay, if you don't start, you're never gonna get there. And I will tell you that this listing on the national priority list is moving almost faster than any listing I've seen since. And quite frankly, we had previous administrations that were just not gonna 
you cannot move forward with EPA unless an administration says okay and previous administrations were not okay and I was a bitch I'll admit it and but so were you you all came together and I'm gonna look I know you're frustrated I'm not a party to the court case so therefore I'm not I'm was not allowed to be in a lot of stuff and everybody had to be careful because there was gag order so I picked up a lot of stuff but after you guys talked to me about the technical stuff, I immediately called Dana, and the two of us are not science, sci I mean, I'm not insulting you, Dana, but I'm right, we're not science geniuses. But I'd be trying to repeat to her what you had just told me, and she'd go, Debbie, this is like Greek, and neither of us speak it. So we're really, we're not happy with where we are, but we have put our feet on the accelerator. EPA, we're, we're moving, we got it, but what you've got now is judges judges who are part of the problem. So I am looking at all of you and telling you that your elected state legislators want to get stronger legislation. They've been there for a while. Make sure you, elections have consequences. They have consequences at the federal level, they have consequences at the state level, and they have consequences at the local level. And there is a presidential election next year that can impact what EPA does or doesn't do. So I'm gonna start there. You got a governor that listened to you and said, let's move forward. You got an EPA administration that we're finally putting money into as well, so there is money to be able to clean up these sites. And we have too many damn Superfund sites around the country, let alone in Michigan, that need to have that kind of money. And there, look, be honest, there were a lot of you that were worried that would a Superfund site, you know, be a toxic image and that, nobody thinks that now. And by the way, there's enough data out there that shows when you do do it. But elections have consequences. So if you care, we are making progress, not as fast as you want, but if this had been done 20 years ago, you would have made some of the progress you want. And now we're gonna do it, we're gonna keep moving forward and remember that you need to care about who you're elected next November. That's what I'm gonna say. All right, where do we, and I know we're gonna, I don't, I know our guests have got flights and stuff, so. We're going to have to spend a little happy and then we'll take these two questions and I think we're going to have to end there. They've had their hands up the whole time. Kathy Griswold, I am a member of CARD. Anyone who wants to get involved, learn more about it, go to CARD. That is the organization. It has tremendous expertise and a lot of passion. Uh, I came in here tonight, oh, I was also on uh, city council for four years, so I know about some of the legal issues and anyway, I won't describe that. But I wanna say, I came in here really excited tonight and we need to leave here really excited. Yes, we have opportunities for improvements and we have problems, but we also have a dual path. So we've got the court, it's more immediate, it's, it's not perfect, but it's there. And then we have the EPA, which is the long-term strategic solution to this problem. So um, the other thing I wanna mention, and maybe someone can address it, is this plume is more complicated because it is a glacial aquifer. Um, and that, that makes it more complicated. Um, I was also going to ask, given that we have a true leader in President Santa Ono, is someone going to work with him because we need the University of Michigan to stand up. They remain silent way too long. Thanks. I will talk to him. I'll take that as a uh, we're, we're at that and then here, and then I think we're gonna, he had one over here, then I, I have to be sensitive to our panelists' time. Let, let's go there and then we'll go to these two. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rita Mitchell. I'm chair of the Ann Arbor Environmental Commission and speaking for myself tonight though, as a citizen. Um, I do want to say though that the Environmental Commission voted unanimously in October 2020 to advise our city to support effective cleanup of the toxic plume. Um, and we continue to wait for the remediation, as you know. Um, one of the related concerns um, for the underground plume I wanted to raise is the issue of an illicit discharge of the dioxane in the Allen Creek drain, which is a municipal separate storm sewer system. It's called an MS4. The drain follows the surface topography and connects directly to the Huron River 
as the ground as the ground elevation drops in the easterly direction toward the Huron River, um, it has shown an illicit discharge, and um, that is being monitored. But it's really important that that be included in this um, continued evaluation and remediation, and that's a concern that I have because we've gone for years of finding some some uh, of the discharge and then. Um, for no further action, multiple, multiple meetings. And I'll, I'm sure you my speech a lot by saying the, all the meetings and discussion are kind of swirling around and going down the drain toward the Huron River, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. And it's a real concern because where that Allen Creek drain goes out into the Huron, it's just a quarter of a mile from the outflow of the Argo Cascades where people go tubing. And so potential exposure is right there. And I want to make sure that we address that as well. Thank you. Mike, will you I, I've raised this because trust me, you guys have raised it with Thank me. You. And I've talked to Aaron, who's the acting director of Eagle right now, but and he assures me that they are making sure that look, I, I was at Ann Arbor Township and they raised the issue of the Huron River too, and I was on the phone with Aaron within an hour. So Mike, why don't you take that on? Yeah, all I, all I can tell you is that uh, the, our Water Resources Division is addressing the MS4 permit uh, along with uh, Evan Pratt, the Washtenaw County Water Resource Commissioner, to, to uh, address this issue that you're talking about. Okay, we'll get back to you. We'll get, Evan's not here, he's out of the, so we'll, we'll work together to get back to you with specific. Nobody's gonna be ignored tonight. We're gonna take and keep working, you guys. Hi. My name is Jim Osborne, I live in Ann Arbor. Thank you for coming today. Uh, the point I'm making is, uh, it's great that you're all here for a problem that happened with this plume, but uh, no one's talking about uh, preventing these things. And what comes to my mind is two things. We have a pipeline that runs through Washington County that transports oil. One of them runs through property and through the backyard that I own. The other one is railroads that cross bridges, particularly over Barton Pond. And if there's a railroad accident, it will dump the stuff into the Barton Pond. And the pipeline uh, is only inspected every five years per federal regulation. So no matter what the state does, that cannot be changed. It has to be changed at the federal level. And the pipeline was built in 1953. So it's an old pipeline, it grows. And it's an excellent way to happen. A similar pipeline in Santa Barbara is built 100,000 gallons, I'm sorry, 100,000 barrels into the Pacific Ocean about five years ago. Thank you. So I'm going to have you ask your question as well. Thank you. I'm Bob Wood. Um, I've been a registered professional engineer for about 50 years, working, not correcting on this, but in all my businesses, I've had to work on water, water wastewater treatment. I'm also a resident and my home is just outside the current plume. So I have personal and technical stuff. Uh, I'm interested in how to get the aquifer in all hand. If you don't like look it up. Um, for one question, uh, can I get my water tested if I ask for it? Is there somebody that's something that I can go to get my, my water tested? You can always, I mean, any, any citizen, any citizen can, you know, for you know, fee, uh, can get their, their well tested or their water tested and then send it to the Eagle Lab. There's a, there's a process for that. If you're asking for getting your water tested because of where you're at in, in relation to the plume. Right. Well, well, I think they're going to change the standards. I'll make it okay. Well, well what we do with that, that yearly monitoring I discussed, we discussed tonight, is we work with the Washington County Health Department. Okay. Uh, the technical people, myself and the technical people, uh, Jenny Kahn is the person I work with uh, directly. We identify and we use, uh, evaluate where we sample each year, uh, depending on where uh, contamination is and what, what the last sampling has been. We've come up with some rules uh, of distances from the contamination where we want to make sure we do sample. Uh, but I, you know, as far as uh, you can request that and identify where you are to myself and Jenny, and we will take that into consideration. Okay. But, you know, it's evaluated every, it's evaluated every year, and uh, we uh, come up with where we're sampling for that year. Yeah, very good, I'll call them. So next question, um, is when the standards standards change and or my current well does not meet the standards, uh, what do we do? 
do you have, I, so you're talking about bottled water, that might take some of the drinking water problems, but you can still absorb things through your skin. This gentleman out here would probably like to see some studies on that, as I would as well. Um, so, um, what do you, uh, you have suggestions other than bottled water for existing homeowners? If you're, on a, you're currently on a well? Right. Well, if, you're, if, you're, if your well became contaminated by the plume, then, you know, besides bottled water, then the next step would be to get you hooked up to municipal water. I mean, that's thing that happened in the South Township. Um, but I do, actually, I've been working in this field for quite a while. There is a technical solution for this that can be done in a particular home, probably for a couple thousand dollars. The reverse osmosis? No, no, no. Ozone. You use the ozone. Well, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. It's very easy. To, I, I actually had most of the system installed in my home already just to remove the iron from the water. Yeah. It's very simple. You simply aerate it and filter out the sediment. Right. And it was in it, you got, got a home treatment system. Not expensive at all. And I don't have a lot of hope for, for disappearing this plume that's been there for 30 years. Uh, but there are some things you can do on an individual basis. And it wouldn't cost very much. I, know I, don't, you know, I don't know how much money Delman has. Uh, Either bankrupt and still bankrupt, and maybe it's still not solved the problem. I sure. appreciate all the work that everybody's doing, but I would go for a, for a personal, technical solution to this thing that could be done very quickly. It could be done tomorrow. It doesn't cost that much money. Uh, I can tell you how to do it. I spent an afternoon with their engineers to tell you exactly how to do that in the system for myself. And, uh, Okay, I'm going to, can I get you to talk to some of the individual electeds who want to help sure. you and some of the experts, and Clark is telling me that they, you can also direct questions to them and they would want to with you. Okay, I'd be happy to work with them if they want to. Just a comment on, on, on the litter pay, that's pretty good as long as they have the money. Well, that's, and at the federal level, right, when so we've, we've got that, we've got to put right. the money into it. So let's see. Okay, so I, I, yep. I would like to address your questions about the federal level. And maybe it's a good way to close and then say there are a lot of people here I know. I tried to take these, have, unfortunately, we've got people with planes and uh, you Can want I to do it very quickly. Okay, go ahead. I'll take two minutes. I'm Rita Lock Caruso. I'm Professor Emeritus of Toxicology from the University of Michigan. I want to make two, two points. One point is that just last year, the National Institute of Environmental Sciences, which is a, one of the institutes of the National Institute of Health, or NIH, just funded a center at Yale, the focus of which is 1,4-dioxide. They have projects to study remediation, detection, cl uh, cleanup, toxicology, and human studies. I have the privilege of serving on the external advisory board for that center. And that has been helpful because we have generated a lot of interest from that center in our local environmental contamination. And it's opening up some opportunities for collaborations and interactions. The second point I want to make, so I just want people to be aware of that. So yeah. the second point is that the mention of what's happening as the plume has moved east. We were told for years, for decades, don't worry about becoming coming in contact with this plume because it's 100 feet or more below the surface. And the problem is that the majority of this plume is migrating to the east. And as it migrates to the east, the elevation of the ground is coming down to the plume. So here's the plume. And the elevation is coming to the plume. And now that contamination plume is nearing the surface of the ground. And it's in contact with some basements. And that plume is coming. And if the EPA and EGLE act quickly, we can prevent this hazard from growing. We don't have to wait till it's an emergency. Uh, that plume is coming, more contamination is coming. These are wet basements, they're in the high water table. So thank you. That's why we're all here. I want to answer, that's probably a good way to close tonight. At the federal level, we're trying hard to get that kind of legislation done. Again, elections have consequences. Uh, Fred Upton and I did a pipeline safety bill. Okay, bipartisan even, but there were, it, it's almost impossible to get anything through the United States and I'm sorry, but that's the, you know, they, they put, so we've got a pipeline safety bills passed through the house, but you've got a governor and an attorney general and a legislature right now that they're trying to close, shut down the Enbridge line under the, you see all the litigation. We have due process in this country, but 
but people are working on pipeline safety. You want to talk about water? Those of you who are asking if we've talked to the University of Michigan, yesterday I was at the University of Michigan at a round table with the advocates from around the state on the subject of water, period. Everybody's got a right to, it's a human right to have access to clean, affordable water, period. We learned from Flint what the consequences of that are. Rashida Talib, and I, this, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were telling people, you gotta wash your hands. And yet people's water was being shut off around the state, especially in Detroit. I said to Nancy Pelosi, Nancy, we had a pandemic and we're looking and people are having their water shut off. One of the first things we were able to do is to stop water shutoffs. And then we were able to get, like Lahif and others, a program during the pandemic so that there is a fund that will pay to have people who can't afford their water and have water turned back on. And too many people don't know about the program. It's going to expire at the end of September. We're working again to get it permanently authorized the way that Lockheed and others are. CAN is the organization in Washington County that is, again, we're Washington County, so we're doing better than a whole lot of other places that don't know the money's out there and people even care. And railroads? I, what happened, I, we have already, we have had, and actually the Republicans are with us on this one. Unfortunately, what we saw happen in Palestine, Ohio, has awakened the country's conscience to what happens with the railroads. We are having safety hearings, we are trying to get railroad safety legislation passed. We, the state is working um, at the same time. The railroads are already, they don't notify you when they're carrying these cards. They're, I've learned more than I have. We have the EPA administrator came in immediately. We had a town hall with her. I want to say this about Region 5. Deborah Shore is responsive. You know, this is, I asked her once, do I have the worst congressional district in the country? Because, you know, we had flat rock chemical spill. I've got more Superfund sites than you all realize. We were in industrial area, and nobody gave a damn when they built all these plants, and it was great for the economy, but we're left with cleaning it up. Well, we are the voices that have got to make ourselves heard and keep fighting to clean up these sites. So we want to be the leaders. We've got leaders now, and both the federal and state level, that, and the local level that want to do that. You can't stop fighting. You gotta keep your voices heard, you gotta keep pushing. I want that. I didn't realize Sierra Club was here or I would have mentioned them with the L C B and everybody. We're all working hard. So you're right, keep your voices heard, engage, don't sit at home and bitch at the television. Get out there and work. And remember elections have consequences. I wanna thank all of our panelists for being here. I think you, you look, you got a right to be concerned. I know all you're elected. We all talk about this all the time because we do care. We're gonna keep working, we're gonna treat we're not gonna stop. You should be concerned. But we wanted to we wanted to help you answer straight questions about where we are, what we are, who's gonna manage, and Actually, if some of you were in the meeting, the first meeting we were in, I was so depressed, I didn't think anything could happen. We've made a lot of progress. We're not gonna stop. We're gonna keep protecting the citizens of Washington County. And I know that the men and women at this table want you all to be safe. And that is, and the men and women, the, your elected officials, are gonna stay on this and not, not take their eye off it for one second. And I thank all of you. a lot of things tonight and some of it involves the work of our department. You know, I I want to follow up on these conversations that we're having right now. I want to talk to the subdivisions, um, obviously any environmental groups that have advice for us. I mean, I'm not Mr. Burns, okay? I have no <laughs> ulterior motivation here but to do everything in my power to protect these communities. That's it. 
Uh, I have three and a half years left in, in office, you know that I'm term limited out. And I want to spend every minute of that doing as much as I possibly can to protect all of you uh, and, and do whatever my department can do in regarding, you know, in regards to this plume. So I am open to suggestions. I, I want to keep the dialogue going. You know that Debbie Deagle is going to continue to call me three times a day about this. Um, but I, I want to have that conversation with as many people as possible. And any questions that we didn't get to tonight, to the extent that we can, to provide answers to all of you. And you know, she could have sent Daniel and said she was in Alaska like Aaron is, who he really is. And by the way, I want to thank Tim and De De for coming in. He is the head of the Superfund Division. He's new, but he knew, like EPA and Eagle, like Aaron, who's the acting director and um, the boss of, there are many Eagle people here, uh, was like, of course we'll do it. What's the date? And that, I mean, these departments, they want to be accessible to you. They want to answer your questions. People care. And I, I can remember how desperate and frustrated and angry I was when I still started. I still am, but we are making progress. And remember, I'm not a party to the courts. I think the court system needs change, and you need to like, work on that too. So thank everybody. We're all here for